have, and we've been talking about our questions over the last few months, is what's going to happen when we die? When will it end? What does eternity mean? For the next two weeks, this will be our focus. Not because we have all of the answers, but because the questions are important. We all want to know what happens because we live in a fallen world, a world of suffering, a world of pain, of fear that causes us to look forward and hang onto the hope that we have been promised. Luckily for us, as we go, the world might be fallen, but it is not without grace, and so fear, suffering, and pain are not the only things found in our world, but so too are kindness, justice, peace, and goodness. Today we're going to talk about what's been known as many things. The end of the world, the second coming of Christ, the apocalypse, Armageddon. All exciting and fun things to do, talk about on a dreary day like today. So today we're doing a brief overview of parts of Revelation and a bit of history on what Christians have believed about Christ's return, what some still believe, and what is a healthy understanding. Our scripture t- today comes from the book of Revelation. Now, I um, said chapter 20. Okay, so chapter 20 is going to be what we're talking about um, instead of what is in the bulletin. This is the culmination of... So Revelation was written by John um, imprisoned on the island of Patmos. Uh, this is his apocalyptic vision. This is his vision uh, for the, uh, what he sees as the end of the world. This chapter's... 21 through 23, which we're going to talk about a little bit next week, speak of the wonders of heaven after the fact. But John is speaking to the churches in the early church in those first few centuries, telling them that of the way that Babylon, so Revelation talks about Babylon, and the way that Babylon would be destroyed. So after the destruction of Babylon through up, coming up to chapter 18, and the defeat of the beast comes chapter 20. So here's our scripture today. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his key hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and locked and sealed it over him, so that he would deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be let out for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and those seated on them were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come into life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison, will come out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, in order to gather them for battle. They are as numerous as the sands of the sea. They marched up over the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and the one who sat on it. The earth and the heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Also another book was opened, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and were judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So, apocalyptic literature. So, Throughout the Bible, there are different uh, stories that are known as apocalyptic li- literature. That It's written throughout the Bible, and it's written specifically in times of deep societal upheaval. The Old Des- Testament doesn't talk much about what happens after death, except during the times of exile. So when the people of Israel were outside of Israel, they were living in exile, they were living as slaves in another country, then they wrote 
these times of ex- or apocalyptic li- literature in exile, it shows a strong and mighty God beats on the enemies of Israel. And of course, I think my battery is going. The writers speak in metaphors as a way to mask the words of resistance to their oppressors. Now, John is imprisoned on Patmos. So John is uh, one of the... We believe that John is one of the original apostles. He's imprisoned by Rome, and he's writing to the church in the midst of the worst of the church's persecution. So he's writing about the downfall of Rome, the persistence of the martyrs, and the ultimate power of God. Humans, as we are, we get preoccupied with the end of times during great turmoil. The predictions about the end of days surface again and again as people try to find an ending point. If everything is awful, then at least we'll be done with it soon. Think about the dystopian literature, dystopian meaning um, broken worlds, dystopian literature and movies that have developed in our current culture of fear. Science fiction in general works to help us create futures that are easier to understand. Much like John's writings about Rome, these kind of books, and, and they, they use ancient or future times to talk about what's happening now. So John was writing about Rome, but he's talking, he says Babylon. Using the ancient civilization of Babylon, he writes in the future, so to keep from writing threats about his oppressors. He's writing about the people that are literally imprisoning him at the moment. Anxiety as a community and anxiety as a person convinces us that we need to focus on the eternal, especially those whose suffering appears to be unavoidable. From oppressed groups like the early Christians being sent to the Colosseum, or Africans held in slavery here in America looking for a way out, some of our best hymns about heaven or waiting for heaven come from those very people in slavery singing spirituals while in the fields. In times of drought or great economic downturn, our eyes, we lift our eyes above our current suffering and we look to the future. And what great hope we have to know that there is future beyond which we could imagine. Now as for when or how, or why Jesus will return, the church has believed many things over the last 2,000 years. Like I said last week, uh, from Paul in the early church believing that Jesus would return any day now. Paul wrote, don't get married unless you can't help yourself because Jesus is going to be back tomorrow, so don't worry about it. The church, as that changed, as time went on, the church began to understand that it might take a little bit. John's revelation made the church believe that with the fall of Rome, Jesus would return. And when that didn't happen, that thousand years he writes about in chapter 20 seemed important. So Christ's return was supposed to be around the year 1000. And as time continued, the theories began to abound. As soon as a specific number of Christian, people were Christians, then Christ would return. That's when I heard when I was younger. As soon as the world got bad, bad enough, whether through the plague or wars or struggles or droughts or famines. You see, we want to know that the troubles we're dealing with are signs of the end because then they have a purpose. Just as when we tell people who are grieving or ill that everything happens for a reason. It's feel-good theology. Because if suffering is for a higher purpose, then we can stand it. But if suffering is because we live in a broken world, then we can't find that higher purpose. If war and fear and societal struggle are signs of the end, then God is coming and there is a higher purpose and we can focus on that. But if war and fear and societal struggles are because we are human and sinful, then we've got to accept our own place in it and work to change it. The details of these stories of the end The stories and the uh, prophecies that come out every few years of, well, this is, I believe the world was supposed to end in May. I know it was supposed to end in 2012. I know there was something, I mean, how many of you remember 
you know, Y2K. <laughs> I was a middle schooler. Y2K was scary. But these stories and books, like uh, Left Behind, you probably say the rapture, red rapture stuff. Um, today, uh, the Left Behind books or other apocalyptic stories often they often take parts of John's writings or other apocalyptic bits and pieces throughout the Bible. Those books and movies came from the idea called the Rapture. Now, if you don't want to know what the Rapture is, I'm going to explain it a little bit. The Rapture is the idea that before that thousand years that John talks about, uh, God will rapture or grab out of the world the faithful few that will skip the suffering. And if you struggle with this idea and have seen the latest Avengers movie, this is the snap. Just for the, and if you haven't, don't worry about it. This, comes, this idea comes from a guy um, named John Nelson Darby. Uh, he believed that the church would be caught out of the world, i.e. raptured, removed from earth to heaven so that God could once again act in history through the nation Israel. Darby believed that for, in order for the end of times to come, for Jesus to come back, the church had to get out of Israel's way. And so uh, needing to get rip, rid of it, he understood this as the rapture. Um, many of those who believe in this theology are very focused on the strength of the nation of Israel and bring it into their politics. You'll notice that. Their thinking being, if Israel needs to be strong for Jesus to return, let's make it strong. Darby's biblical reasoning comes from one verse in, the, uh, in 1 Thessalonians. It says, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Now this has, has led, led to the understanding of the rapture. This understanding of Christ's return, starting with our neighbors disappearing, is in reality a false teaching that keeps us from doing God's work and from listening to Christ's words of mystery and unknown times. In the Articles of Religion of the United Methodist Church, I don't try to read you from these very often, but our understanding of God's reign is laid out. Because while we wait for the ultimate renewal of God's good creation of Christ's return, we do not wait alone. It says, with other Christians, we recognize that the reign of God is both a present and and future reality. The church is called to be a place where the first signs of the reign of God are identified and acknowledged in the world. Wherever persons are being made new creatures in Christ, wherever the insights and resources of the gospel are brought to bear on the life of the world, God's reign is already effective in its healing and renewing power. We also look to the end time in which God's work will be fulfilled. This prospect gives us hope in our present actions as individuals and as the wider church. This expect expectation saves us from resignation and motivates our continuing witness and service. This is the basis of our theology of the end. Christ calls us into the work of the reign of God. And as we live our lives as Christians with the knowledge that through us and through the work of Christians and the church around the world, God's reign is revealed. God is revealed. Christ tells us again and again to pay attention and to not slack off. But that doesn't mean to be anxious or so afraid you can't sleep for worry about whether or not you've got it all figured out with God. Because God's reign shows us that in our freedom from worry, in our freedom from fear, we find God. When we are afraid, we seek out answers, even if the answers are unsettling. But the answers don't have to be so unsettling because God, as we were talking about with the kids, God is already here with us. We're not focused so much on a time in the future where God will return and all will be well, which we believe. But that's not all. God is already here with us. It's not that we are alone waiting for some cataclysm. We are here with God amongst us. God breaks into the world every time we choose justice over injustice. 
God breaks into the world every time we seek healing instead of hiding from our addictions. God breaks into the world every time we choose people over money. When we do good instead of harm. Each and every time we choose good instead of the evils of the world, God is there showing up in the world through us. We are bringing about God's reign. I've seen God in the life of this congregation. I've seen God through people faced with tragedy and they still find ways to choose life and goodness. I've seen God in a group of people gathering to talk about the mundane things of running a church and stopping to pray for the children that they'll see coming. I've seen God in a group of men who working very hard to lay the groundwork for this new lift. I've seen God in those that sacrifice in order to help pay for the ministries of this church. I've seen God in the celebrations, in the tragedies, and in the responses we give to both. Think about the ways that God has broken into your life. And I use that phrase specifically. Because sometimes it feels like God is breaking down our wall. 